number two. Don't oh, forget your names as, um, as you speak. I know, I know most I of you. I was getting to it. <laughs> <laughs> I am Jake. I'm Andrew. Yeah. I'm Gordy. All right, and yeah, we're the IDOSA. It's a, quite an acronym for Indoor Digital Orientation Communication and Enabling Navigational Technology. And no, we did not make that up. Um, yeah, next slide. Okay, so just to start, the uh, Adosin is a knowledgeable tour guide, and our sponsor, who is the uh, Research Center for Persons with Disabilities, uh, he actually made that up for us, and so we titled our application after it. But our challenges to this were indoor navigation. Um, the challenges of being indoor, obviously, you don't have GPS, so we had to figure out another way around it. So what we did is we discovered an alternative, um, which is Wi-Fi along with a couple other um, built-in technologies too. And we also uh, decided to go with the smartphone app because we wanted to do something that utilized technology people always had with them. Um, and the hardest part would be, since this is the, uh, sponsored by the Research, Research Center for Persons with Disabilities, that we needed to incorporate this so that blind people can use it as well. So we had to go for a universal design that everyone could use. Okay, so we researched um, four different technologies on how to, um, like what to concentrate to help us make this work. Um, Bluetooth being the first. Um, Bluetooth is a, it's an open wireless protocol. More to say, it's, it's made a lot of progress. It's on like revision four by now. But and it has a lot of great features built into it. Um, it it's fast, uh, it has a really good network signal, and it, um, you can keep track of up to 200 uh, uh, receivers at one time. Uh, the problem with Bluetooth, though, is that the API doesn't have a lot of, um, it's, it's really functional, but it doesn't have um, built-in signal strength, which is what's usually used for um, distance and location. Um, so uh, any kind of uh, location of Bluetooth was kind of out of the question, just because we couldn't calculate it ourselves. Uh, the RF ultrasonic was actually the second choice we were going to uh, pursue, but uh, this was a little bit unfeasible, mainly because this requires external hardware, which would have been, would have made this a lot less feasible uh, to implement. So we'd have to do a lot of driver programming, um, along with uh, encouraging others to, in order to use the technology, to purchase an additional microcontroller or uh, RFID chip. Um, that, and in order to make this um, to work with location, you would have to have lots of points everywhere, uh, all around the room. Uh, the third point is Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi was the most, we, we said it was the most feasible option. Um, it, it's already built into most buildings by now. Uh, access points are everywhere, and um, it's got, it, it works pretty good through walls, which made it a big plus. Um, and then the last one was dead reckoning, which doesn't require any external hardware. It's more or less um, uses the accelerometer on your phone and it tries to judge how fast you're moving. The problem <coughs> with that reckoning is that it's not 100% accurate and its error rate compounds as you go along. So the further, like the, the longer you use it, the more off you get. Um, I think that's about it. <coughs> all right, well, considering all these technologies, we have to Name figure first. out. Please. I'm Andrew. Sorry. <coughs> well, considering all these technologies, we had to look at what objectives we needed to focus on the most um, while considering those. So, first thing, as Jake mentioned a little bit, a lot of our infrastructure on Michigan State involves steel or aluminum buildings. So, with that, we don't have access to a GPS signal. So, we want to be able to locate a user um, on a smartphone, and also we'd like to locate that user within four feet accuracy. Uh, we'd like to direct that user to different points of interest, um, such as the restroom shown here. And we'd like to provide audio and visual feedback. One, audio feedback for an, a blind user, um, visual feedback for, say, a visitor is coming on campus. They could download our smartphone app, and they could find their way within different buildings on campus if they're looking for a particular classroom or office. So. Um, in addition to this, we've been in communication with a gentleman named Al from the RCDP Research Center, and he's been helping us guide along um, different features that would be useful for a blind user. <coughs> so, 
So this, we use this chart here to help us focus um, which technologies would be most feasible. We're uh, obviously a design team with only four months to uh, accomplish these objectives. So <clears throat> we line them all up and rank them based on this legend at the bottom. And some areas we looked at were what available tools and resources do we have already versus need to purchase. Um, how easy will this be to deploy on campus into our buildings? Uh, how easy is it to use? Um, you know, by how expensive is it? How accurate is it? And what are each of our previous um, experiences or what kind of previous knowledge do we have on these technologies already? So as you can see, uh, Wi-Fi came out to be our best result and followed by dead reckoning to be next. decided to develop on the Android platform because it was free and really easy to get started on. Just go online and download the software for the kids on the and just get started programming with Java. Also, I have an uh, Android phone, so we had a device to program it. Um, so right now, the app takes in, it uh, scans all the access points available, and gets their information, most importantly, their unique physical MAC address and the signal strength uh, associated with that, which is a number between zero and negative 100 uh, power ratio. And then you can feed that number to a uh, function that's given through the Wi-Fi API that will translate it between a number 1 and 20. And so like in that example, the access point 1 would be given a number like 20, 2 would be given 15, 3, 10. And then we'll access the server, which will have all the locations of all those uh, access points stored on it. That's either like latitude, longitude, or if we have to, we can make our own uh, like relative coordinate system. And they'll take the location of each um, access point, multiply it by the number that was assigned to it, add those all up, and divide it by like the total, so 20 plus 15 plus 10, to give a weighted average. They'll use that as the uh, location of the user. And then they can put that location on a map that's downloaded from the server show where they are, and the server will be able to give turn-by-turn -turn directions to navigate them to points of interest, um, probably using a Dijkstra's algorithm to, uh, from one point to another through all the other points that we assign on the maps. Uh, there'll be points like going down halls and doorways so that it doesn't try to walk you through a wall. Um, so, so far we've got the Wi-Fi triangulation working. We, uh, set up in a hallway, just four routers, to walk down the hallways and uh, look at the locations of data. Um, it's really accurate in the middle, between like two to five feet accuracy. Um, near the edges, it's not very accurate because like, if you're by exit point one and you're still picking up the other two, they'll affect the average that's they're still showing up, they'll pull it up so that the locations will off. So we're hoping to incorporate dead reckoning into this, use <coughs> The location from in the middle that we're confident about as a start point, and then uh, have dead reckoning show us where we've gone since then, give us more accurate reading around the edges. Here's our fast diagram, our uh, basic function is to direct the user to various points of interest. And in order to do that, most importantly, we need to locate the user, which we do by assigning the signal strength numbers and uh, averaging them up. We also have to have uh, information stored on the server, the maps, the uh, access point locations, and uh, points of interest. So we can give the turn by turn directions. We do need to be able to give them both audibly and visibly, since this should be used for everybody, but importantly, it's for the blind, so we need to be able to speak to them. So you guys are going to get All right, and then uh, well, I'm Gordy Stein. Um, and we assess our, our risk, uh, the risks taken with our design approach. Um, and there were the three uh, main risks that we identified were based on our, uh, our critical path on our uh, ArcGAN chart. Uh, the first one was, uh, what if we can't obtain the physical GPS locations of each router in the building? We'd have no way of mapping that. 
um, based on this, this chart here, this assesses the likelihood on this axis and then the severity or the impact on the other axis. So for example, this one we assess as a 12. Uh, we assess it as serious and then it's, it's, uh, it's likely. So it's about a 12 mid, mid risk. Um, the middle one was uh, so the second risk that we had um, assessed was Wi-Fi algorithm cannot be refined within plus or minus three feet. Well, we, we did some testing and we've already gotten it within three to five feet, so that's kind of low, low risk. That was pretty. And then the last one was navigation algorithm uh, and specified paths cannot be turned. What if we can't route someone through the building? Um, that had um, serious impact, but low likelihood we, we know we could accomplish that. Uh, this is our uh, the Gantt chart, every, every team made one. Uh, it started uh, February 14th all the way until design day. Um, and then our critical pad, it's not highlighted here, but it's um, with the algorithm, the mapping, and the testing. So it would be uh, these three here. And if, if those don't get done, then the project fails. So <coughs> that was the, the main issue to assess here. And then, slide. and then the last one was our budget. Um, for the IDOSIM, uh, most of it's software. We're developing on a, um, on a free platform uh, for the Android. Um, so most of that, that coding is done for free and in, in-house. And so we haven't spent much money. We did spend uh, some of our budget on four routers for testing. Um, those are the routers we use down the hallway and we continue to use. Um, so the financial analysis, we still have plenty of money in the bank. So I guess that's our, that's our team. Yeah, any questions? Uh, have you considered the nonlinearity of the signals, like going through walls, and instead of using uh, some sort of averaging, using a lookup table instead? I don't know if we've uh, thought about using a lookup table, but that's definitely that's definitely a problem. So like, if you're physically um, five feet from the router, but it's through a wall and it says you're, you're 20 feet, that's, that's a problem we're gonna have to deal with. Um, we've tried it with routers in the lab and through the glass, and it, hasn't had much effect, but through a physical wall. Yeah. Also, there's <clears throat> another feature we're working on where um, you kind of wait a few seconds or a few milliseconds and wait and collect an average of, of all the access points in the area. So at one point in time, you could get two different signal strengths from one router. So if we kind of average those over a small collection, then we can get a better result. Um, if they're blind, how do they see what, what app they're on and get into the That's, That was one question we had in the beginning. Um, Al, we were talking to Al, he's, he's blind and he works over for the department. And uh, I guess the, the iPhone is very user-friendly uh, user for that. Uh, there's a whole set of different, um, what do they call it? Uh, there's different commands and everything for, you can enable a blind user mode and versus one touch to confirm an uh, icon click or something, and actually just two. And the first click reads what the user touched, two confirms the click, and also scrolling. And everything has a whole new list of features. So like Tori said, Al, this guy we've been working with, he actually owns a Verizon iPhone he just got, and he's all amped about it, and um, he's able to use it just as flawlessly as you or I would. So um, the technology is already built into smartphones for blind capabilities. Okay, any other questions? All right.